Okay, we have a good episode today. We've been kind of on this kick of people that had influencer businesses that turned into real businesses. And the one that we're going to talk about today doesn't fit that model perfectly because Dave Portnoy wasn't really like an influencer back in the day. He was really just trying to grow a gambling business, for lack of a better word. But he turned it into a massive media behemoth. And I think it's super interesting. We're going to talk about Barstool Sports and Dave Portnoy and kind of what it looked like. So Dave went to University of Michigan for undergrad and he loved sports gambling. And back in like 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, there wasn't a great way to have like sports books advertised. And so at very first, he was trying to do a newsletter, like a newspaper style thing. The reason why it did well was because back then, all of the bookies, basically, they wanted to go offline and they wanted a print version <laughs> of the stuff that they were trying to get advertising for. And so I think he originally started wanting to do like a blog and internet thing. And then they all were like, we're not interested in blog internet. We want this to be like a physical newsletter newspaper for him to do. And so in 2003, he releases his first print issue. And I think that he was just like total hustler. I think he would stand outside the subway in Boston, <laughs> print out like physical copies of the newsletter and just pass them out to people that were interested. I don't know that they were interested or I think that they weren't interested. Just passed out to anyone who would like, you know, he kind of looked like if you ever go to Times Square and it's like the spider-man and like uh, the yeah. <laughs> guy like trying to like bad uh, <laughs> buzz and woody <laughs> yeah like trying to like force you to take a picture with them like outside of times square so they can charge you 12 yeah. bucks or whatever like that's kind of how i imagine dave starting hustling the paper and so he realized that there's that gap in sports betting and so he started to produce this local boston newspaper that featured sports bets there are some pictures that are kind of funny that we'll probably put in show notes or something that I think when it really started to take off is when he started pairing like chicks in bikinis with like the sports bets <laughs> and that crushed it. What else did y'all see from like the beginnings of Portnoy getting started doing Barstool? Yeah, a couple of things. It's interesting. First four years, he was apparently in IT marketing consultant. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And look, University of Michigan, good school. Imagine yeah. the guy was maybe smarter than he lets on as part of his character it, as yeah. El Presidente. And so part of me wonders if he had an idea, a little hunch that, yeah, run a newsletter, but, and actually playing around a way back machine, hmm. he put up a website in 2003, launched in 2004, and you could see every back issue. So for him, he had a couple of channels running. He was handing this thing out, but you can see every old issue in the way back machine. And he was writing, like he was writing all of it. He, well, right? he actually, almost all of it. Yeah. So he had a, he said childhood friends would actually help him write the articles under like pseudo accounts. So it made him seem like they were a lot bigger. So he was like, oh, we have like tons of writers. If, I imagine he's, if he's trying to sell the sponsors or something like that. He'd be like, oh yeah, I got, you know, it's that typical Chris, the producer podcast guy. It's like, oh yeah, we got tons of people on the team. Like we're doing great. And there's tons of stuff happening. So. Yeah. I think you're right about the hustler in him. Like, I think that's just been from day one. The other fun fact there, apparently he grew up with Todd McShay, went to high school with him. <laughs> yeah, they were no roommates. Way. And so they actually had a radio show, local sports radio in Boston in 2004. So this guy was attacking the market in a few different angles. That's crazy. And then from what I saw, I think in 07, they kind of move it online. Yeah. I mean, he has this quote. He says, it was all word of mouth. I never put a penny into advertising. All the money was coming, going back out to Barstool to try to find writers. And I think you can see like even up until the first sale that they did a couple of years later in 2016, that it was a pretty ragtag operation. <laughs> and like it almost succeeded off of like Portnoy's just force of will of <laughs> making it happen. And you kind of say like that he had a plan. It seemed like he just like, went for it and never took no for an answer as opposed to like having some savvy strategy other than just hustle it. Mm -hmm. I think he had a hunch. I mean, these uh, newsletters, Barstool Sports, and you should put one in your show notes, but 
the tagline was by the common man for the common man. <laughs> Yeah. And again, his character has been more or less the same for 20 years now. Of, yeah. I'm the Boston guy. I'm the mass hole in his words. Yeah. I'm going to lean into that. Yeah. I'm going to speak to sports, women, gambling, degenerate gambling. Yeah. And I think he just had a hunch again that there was an underserved market, not yeah. just in Boston, but maybe beyond, but certainly in Boston. Yeah. And then kind of the way that it takes a turn is in 2016. Barstool decides to take an outside investment. So they sell a majority of the company to a group called the Chernin Group. It's a private equity firm based out of California. And they do a lot of investment in media style companies. I actually looked up the guy who started the Chernin Group, who's like a total badass. He was part of News Corp. He like headed up Modern Family, 24, uh, he like launched like 140 TV stations internationally. He's and a so media guru. He's a media guy. And I remember watching the announcement that Barstool did. I think it's actually in Times Square. It's like emergency press release. Yeah. Like Barstool has taken an outside investment. Mm -hmm. You know, we sold Barstool to the Churning Group. And the Churning Group has done a lot of these deals. The reason why I think the Churning Group succeeds relative to other private equity firms in this space is it's a pretty risky thing to like you imagine writing a, a 30 million dollar check to barstool and they basically said like we're going to recapitalize the business reinvest in building people outside of dave so that way the brand can survive outside of dave but we will have no say in the editorial content whatsoever you can say whatever, you know, they never tried to muzzle Dave. They never tried to like steer him clear of any controversy or put bumpers yeah. on the way that he plays the game. They just let it ride. I don't think that Dave got massively paid on that deal. It's basically a growth equity check from Churner. And they moved the business from Boston to New York. Barstool finally has a war chest to like properly capitalize the business, pay for writers, pay for content creation. And I think they also kind of relieved Dave of all of the operational onus of the business and let him just run wild. Yeah, yeah he was the chief content creator, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 I saw some weird articles. I don't know how true this is or not, but the person they brought in, the churning group, was like this really successful. XAOL, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. I guess like she was the first one to actually ever run a P&L is what they said. Like some weird thing. Like there's no way that was like, I don't know how true that was. I don't know how like business savvy Dave actually is. I don't know if he's more of just like really good marketer, really good at like creating a lot of noise. Um, I don't and, think, but I mean, I don't know, I've never seen him talk about like really business, business things like that. I think he has a savvy probably business gut of like, yeah, stay in the headlines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's like where the savviness comes. I think he has a, like a penchant for, well, he's like, doesn't care. Like he's just like, I, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I think he's got a penchant for controversy and like that. I think he's in an age where you can cash in on controversy and he's done a good job building a brand around just staying in the spotlight. But yeah, I saw the same thing where basically like yeah. that was the first time the company ever had a profit and loss statement, like period. It's <laughs> just pretty wild to think about, but it also goes to show that this was truly a bootstrapped operation. Yeah. Force of will, like you said, it's force of will that created this massive loyal following of, yeah. mm -hmm. again, people that probably look and sound like him somewhat, right? Mm -hmm. But they're there and we're going to find out. You can monetize that group. As I dug into Churnin, they're actually like the grown up version, not adult like XXX, but <laughs> like grown up version of like what I'm trying to do with buying content businesses and kind of creator led businesses. And Churnin has done a bunch of stuff. It's not only kind of personal brand media stuff. One of their most recent ones was Cars and Bids. Bids. What was that one? Yeah, so Cars and Bids, it's actually like a marketplace to like buy and sell cars. But the cool thing how it was launched was or behind, was like on the backs of this guy named Doug DeMuro. It has like 4.6 million followers on YouTube doing like car reviews. And so he's been doing this thing for 2012 oh, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I know this guy. He's created this incredibly loyal he, follow. He's kind of a... Huge. He's kind of a goober, but yeah, no, it, it, that's like his whole yeah. shtick. Like he like dresses like he yeah. has no money, but like the dude's a little low. And these are <laughs> incredible cars, one of a mm -hmm. kind cars. And he's now to the point where he's buying these cars Yep. as a result of this deal. So yeah. He was running that YouTube channel, 
started Cars and Bids. In 2020. In 2020, and Chernin bought, I think it's a similar deal, like it was a majority buyout. Mm -hmm. Cut him a check for 40 mil yeah. off of an $80 million valuation. Yeah, buy a majority of the business. And so it's the Chernin playbook. And I'm sure that it will be very similar. Like they crushed it <laughs> in Barstool. <laughs> and I'm sure they will crush it on cars and bids as well. Barstool aside, I think you have these like legacy brands. Obviously, Barstool benefited from DraftKings. And there were a couple waves that happened. A, gambling became more accessible to the masses, right? Like in 03, 04, when Dave started Barstool, the only way that you could gamble was either like physically in a casino in Vegas or like illegally with overseas bookie and like you had like poker stars and some of those like online things. But like for sports gambling, you had to either do it overseas, which was super sketchy because the internet was like sketchy, or you had to do it like with a casino, which you couldn't yeah. do over the phone necessarily. And so gambling has become so much more prevalent over the 15, you know, 20 years that he's, that he's been doing Barstool. And obviously content has like, if you look at like the value of having someone's eyeballs over some from 2000 to 2023, it's like. Yeah. And that's what I think actually like this churning group, I think they really understood really well. I think the reason why they bought cars and bids, for example, is so cars and bids is like a pretty heavy competitor to this other site called bring a trailer and bring a trailer said they did. 1 billion in car sales in 2022. And they take about, I think, a 5 to 10% margin, right, on that thing. And so basically this Doug DeMuro guy launches the cars and bids because he's like, hey, I see bring a trailer, what they're doing, but it's super old school, super like definitely to like a different type of market. He's like, I have the distribution and the actual audience of a ton of people who are like growing up in this YouTube stage. And if I just make it really modernized and like way simple, we'll be able to move a ton of cars. And he said like instantly when he launched Cars and Bids in 2020, off the back of his YouTube channel, which had like a couple million subscribers, he's like, the operations was crazy. He's like, we like we're moving cars out, like just insane. And so I think like with the turning group, they even see that they have a couple of Mr. Beast things on here. A lot of like their things are not like crazy ideas. There's like more like modernized, like the aura ring, right? Like all, all these interesting different investments that they're doing that are on the back of like a lot of influencer led, creator led businesses, which is like I think a really, really smart move. And Doug said the same thing, like in an interview mm -hmm. that I listened to that's basically like they invested and they want no say over the content creation you know they're not trying to control what content looks like at all for him and i think it's the only way that you can really do these things because content creators are such a finicky class of bird <laughs> yeah <laughs> that if you try to cage them and say like here's your new content schedule now that we own 51 percent of this business like they'll just wither and die yeah, you see this a lot. You have a strategic acquirer like ESPN that goes out and acquires a business like a Grantland or whatever. And ultimately, they come to loggerheads with, well, in this case, it was Bill Simmons and he got pushed yeah. out, right? Yeah. He goes and starts his competing brand in the space. But the difference between a strategic acquisition or in this case, an investment and a strategic investment in something that clearly had built momentum. Yeah. Why kill your golden goose, right? Yeah, it's like and so uh, it's... It's a calculated risk in knowing that maybe Dave Port is going to do something, say something that gets the business in hot water at some point, but a risk they were willing to take. And I think if you think about like anti-fragile brands, <laughs> brands that benefit from disorder and controversy, totally, <laughs> right? Like it's one thing if you're trying to run a church with Dave Portnoy yeah. <laughs> and you know, you're trying to show this pristine nature of what the brand represents and its aspirational nature. But I think a lot about anti-fragile brands and Dave, like the more controversy he gets into and he's had more than his fair share of it. I would say Donald Trump is another like mm. just completely anti-fragile brand that there's nothing that Donald could do that will turn his people off. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if he murdered somebody, they'd be <laughs> yeah. like, yep, like that guy deserves Just that. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> like that's Donald. He did it for the American people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, Trump's a good corollary there. <laughs> so, like, 
So yeah. I think for Doug, it wouldn't be the same from, you know, if it comes out that he's having an affair, yeah. like, I don't think that that's going to be great for cars and biz, but yeah. if Dave has an affair, it's like, what a total bad. <laughs> well, yeah, it's part of the shtick. It's like, hey, mm-hmm. Doug's the likable car nerd. He's right? the nerdy guy. Yeah, yeah, but has always loved cars, is mechanically inclined. It fits the shtick. Dave, I mean, these very first newsletters, it's beer, it's swimsuits, it's yeah. degenerate gambling, yeah. and it's sports, and it's all of the crappy things about being a Bostonian, the obnoxious things about <laughs> being a Bostonian. So he leaned into that from day one, right? Like, the, probably the biggest thing that Dave could do to kill his brand is if he, like, went into rehab or something yeah. <laughs> rehab goes all in on la the lifestyle and becomes a lakers guy yeah. Yeah. whatever it is but yeah it's he the starts opposite. going to church you know what I'm yeah. saying? there's something different but no he's found an audience and he's found a voice and so churning starts running this thing in 2016 and then bobby you have the pen stuff right i what do is, yeah what does pen look like yeah so pen jumped in in 2020 and they took a 36 percent stake of barstool as February 2020 for 163 million. Didn't that mostly come out of Dave's? Was that? So I think part of it came from Chernin. So as I understand it, after that acquisition, Penn owned roughly the same amount as Chernin. And Dave, so Dave had gotten crammed out. Yeah, Dave and whoever his leadership team were, they did have a percentage of that. Yeah. At some point, the number was mentioned of 21%. So I don't know who all the, the equity stakeholders were or shareholders, but Penn jumped in and they had the rights to come back in and negotiate the additional buyout of the existing shareholders. So they came back in 2023 and they bought out the remaining stake of the company for 388 million. If we're keeping track, $163 million transaction for roughly a third of the company and then 388 million to buy out Chernin and to buy out Dave. And what is Penn? And Penn, (laughs) they're a gambling house. (laughs) Like a bookie? So, I mean, they run everything. They run- yeah, they run, they run apps. They're effectively a legal bookie. They uh, mm-hmm. allow for one of the largest sports bettors in the world. And so what do you think Penn's calculus looks like? Like, why do the deal? Well, yeah, I mean, look, again, go back to 2003. What was he trying to do? It wasn't just a sports newsletter. I'm sure there were plenty of those floating around Boston. Sports Illustrated, whatever. It's, it's a passionate fan base. Bostonians are crazy about their sports. I'm yeah. sure there's plenty to go around. He had a different angle. It's like in the common man, right? And a big part of that was gambling and just leaning into that hard. We are degenerate gamblers. That's what we do. And we're going to give you access to the best picks. Loyally, he had built this loyal following over the course of almost, well, 20 years through 2023. I think they saw this is a great chance for us to capture a really captive audience that comes to consume all sorts of content. And part of that pivot he made, right, was here's a newsletter, interesting things. With the times, they hit blogs, podcasts, YouTube videos. Yeah massive following and now they have a you know members only subscription plan where you can access special content but i'm Are they sure they're the brick and mortar aren't there bar still like physical locations now too uh, i have no that, idea that i don't know about in boston i think there are okay mm. they've done some interesting things there's a bar stool app or a betting app yeah mm. they did the one by pizza so you can buy that at walmart which is tied they have to Barstool Electrolyte. Have you seen the Electrolyte Barstool drink no. that's like morning after? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's actually legit. Yeah. Okay. It's like Pedialyte. <laughs> yeah. I take it when I sit. It's like one of my After you throw drinks. up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so look, they knew like, hey, look, these guys have access to a captive audience that comes back daily. I'm sure they had fantastic daily user metrics on the website on all these different content channels. And so to capture that and to plug them into what is their machine, right, which is betting, gambling, makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Barstool is like one of those assets that's, there's no amount of money that will help you build it from scratch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have to buy it because it's the only, what's the Barstool equivalent? Like what else? You, You're you looking for the alternative to the clean, sterile ESPN, right? Totally. So dead spin, you could probably argue there was some dead spin in terms of sports, Bleach Report, sort of, before they got bought. Yeah. There's The Athletic, which is another churning group investment, yeah. and that's yeah. more hard-hitting real journalism. Yeah. So I think it's for somebody looking for a bit of themselves in sports writing mm-hmm. and maybe more content than that. And yeah. that's what, like you said, they've got an audience that they've found, and it's really hard to go and manufacture that audience when yeah. it's already dedicated to Dave and his crew. Well, this is kind of a cool Barstool connection to it. And then with ESPN is, so... Barstool has like created a whole bunch of these like little mini like influencers, right? Like you've got the Call Our Daddy show, like created these huge shows that ended up either leaving or getting bought out for crazy. 
amount. And so Pat McAfee, who was like this big punter, yeah. he just signed a huge deal with ESPN like a couple of days ago. And it's got to be worth a couple hundred mil because he left his FanDuel partnership, which was 120 mil for like four, like a couple of like three or four years. But you can see like ESPN's catching on that thing now. And Pat Mackey's receiving a ton of backlash right now because of, oh, they're going to Mickey Mouse him. They're going to tie him down. It'll be interesting to see how that whole deal works out. Like if you listen to Pat McAfee's show, it's completely different than what ESPN pushes. It's all yeah. off the like, rails. Like they go crazy. It, I mean, with ABC and Disney, I don't even know how you can touch that. You think that they'll loosen the they ha- I mean, they have to because like, if you've ever listened to Pat McAfee show, they're going to put <laughs> Pat McAfee on. Like, not. they're going to put him on ESPN right after First Take, which is like Stephen A. Smith's like huge thing. Which so it's like they're going to put o'clock. him on air, on air, on TV. Yeah, so he gets on TV and on his YouTube. Like, it's in the I whole can't. licensing deal. I don't know. So like, Pat McAfee said when he signed it, <laughs> he's like, "Thanks, Michael Jordan, for the last dance for throwing a whole bunch of f bombs because like there's a little bit more lenience on us now." And but like they talk about some crazy stuff. That whole show goes completely the other side of the, like yeah. everyone who listens to Pat McAfee's show listens to them because they hate ESPN because like they're the other side of the political spectrum usually. Hey, real quick, if you're a business owner that's doing at least $1 million a year in revenue on a digital or coaching business, we'd love to talk to you. If you go to dealmaven.io and apply on our page, we will get in touch with you and see if we can take your great business and make it even better. One of two things happens here. He either conforms and becomes mm-hmm. a sellout, right? Yeah. Or he stays true to who he is and his character, and ultimately they part ways because something nasty happens. Right? Oh, totally. Yeah, but it's gonna be crazy. There's, there's no middle ground in this. But if he mm-hmm. conforms, then it's worth nothing, right? And then it, like the That's, whole value, yeah. it gets completely. Diluted. Yeah, it's you know it's a strange acquisition, but I'm like, look, our M and A deal is always great. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you're doing a deal just to do a deal. And I guess um, it's more of a license deal too. So it's not they didn't buy him out. It's a license deal for a couple of years or whatever. But yeah, he's on the. He's on air for the next two, three years. I, I'm sure someone's got some colorful market map with all these different customer segments and profiles. <laughs> and they say, you know, we need more of this profile. Who's out there on the market that we can win them with? Yeah, Pat crazy. McAfee. Yeah. That's the group we need. We've lost those guys to oh, dude. the bar stools of the world, right? Yeah, so no that's probably their attempt to kind of get them back or get them in the first place. But Do you ever see have you ever seen Hamilton on Disney Plus? Yeah. And it's like they bleep out. Oh yeah, all of the cuss words. I mean, the Hamilton is like yeah. there's like maybe five cuss words. And yeah, like a couple slightly risque scenes that are like PG thirteen yeah. level. And I can't imagine Disney. Well, you know, Disney's interesting, right? Since they made the Fox acquisition, so they mm-hmm. had Miramax as a brand, and yeah. they put rated R movies out on that. So that was always the so risky. <laughs> yeah. What well, was the? Hey, we're not gonna we're not gonna slap Disney. We're not gonna slap the mouse or the mm-hmm. castle on it, but we can invest in this storytelling right but it was always pretty disparate they go and acquire fox fox has a ton of assets that are more mature and so they're now going through this messy transition phase of how do we merge these two very different groups together of disney which is largely family oriented very open-minded friendly and then you've got kind of the fox world which pushes the boundaries a lot more rated r why are you even you know i mean obviously you need to manage it well if you believe in media that really ultimately the only thing that matters is assets if you own media assets yeah and the world is moving towards consolidation in terms of distribution and that's the disney playbook it's buying marvel it's buying star wars it's buying now fox pixar they've made this playbook they said if we can own the assets and the content creators we then own the very best content we can then dictate the terms of our channel and distribution and we can own the customers yeah and it has worked pretty well to date. I mean, the growth of Disney Plus as an over-the-top platform was by far the fastest Yeah, over Netflix, mm-hmm. over Hulu, which they partially owned. And so I think it's a similar theory of can we gobble up the assets of the content creators? But again, I think there's a dichotomy at play there. It's going to be really interesting. But I think the ones that they've done that have worked well have been like when they bought Pixar, right? Jobs was adamant that it didn't become animation studios right that yeah. pixar mm-hmm. kept its like yeah totally uniqueness right like lucas films same thing that was what george lucas you keep was your like. studios you yeah. keep your people up there like, in northern california totally. yeah like it needs to keep the dna of it let's not like mix the blood and put the mickey mouse thing on it you know the average person wouldn't know that 
Pixar is owned by Disney or that Lucasfilm is owned by because it's just it looks like an asset that gets run on its own. But if you have Pat McAfee that's on air after Stephen A. Smith, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy to me. Be a fun one to It'd watch. Be insane because like it's so not I'll just Pat McAfee. His team is crazy. Like those dudes Can are like broadcast that. Like is that like F- FCC? They're gonna have to. I don't know. Like, yeah, FCC violations for some of those words. <laughs> but you just, no, on a, like the topics. Like just the, even the just like everything they do is it's way out there, man. It's crazy. So it'll be. But I don't know. Like, Last Dance had a ton. They didn't believe it out at all. Is Last Dance owned by ESPN? Ran it. it Oh, it was an ESPN thing. It was, yeah, yeah it was only ESPN, documentaries it was that night. give them more leeway, right? So the 30 for 30s, mm-hmm. uh, Last Dance, it's more about an honest portrayal of yeah. the industry, of the business, of the team, of the individual. I think this is a little bit different because, again, yeah. it's he's kind of a character, right? Dude, yeah. But yeah, they, they, they've got them on like game, what is that, game day? Right? College game day was like last year. So yeah. They've like, yeah. I think they like slowly try to integrate them. As soon as they introduced them, to game day everybody hated him (laughs) because he's just this like really loud obnoxious that he's hilarious and just out there but like most of the espn listeners and watchers do not like that kind of person (laughs) who's just out there i don't know so for barstool who's the next cars and bids who's the next dave portnoy what's the next opportunity is it mr beast is mr beast too big like he's unacquirable at this point who do you think is out there that will be the next Dave Portnoy? That's question one. Question two is, if you didn't have a $40 million war chest or, you know, Chernin, I'm sure, has hundreds of millions of dollars. If you had $1 million of equity to put into a creator, you think, do you think it's doable at that size? Do you think it scales down or, like, it only becomes investable at a size where it, like, is already a star business high growth, owning some level of top line. It seemed like Chernin was running the playbook not because of a P&L or a return on capital or EBITDA or what the purchase multiple was. It was just like there are massive eyeballs here and there's a playbook to be able to monetize those. And obviously hindsight's 2020 and they look like geniuses now. And I guess it could, you know, yeah. if Dave said a Nazi slur, <laughs> that probably is yeah. not that anti-fragile. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that it goes to... <laughs> Goes down to zero. Although well, I think he's. I mean, this was in the last two weeks, but one of his, uh, one of the content guys, Mincy, he was actually kicked off, fired from Barstool. I so just this saw is, that today. Yeah, for reading a rap song out loud and repeating an unforgivable word. And so Penn actually asked them to I just fire saw him. that. Yeah. So maybe Dave is somewhat untouchable, untouchable. but I don't know. It kind of makes you think, like, if he if he did the same thing, would he be out? If you had a million dollars to deploy into something, putting aside who it is, do you think this is the playbook that you would try to run? Would you try to buy into a creator that has, call it a million subscribers, right? Dave was probably somewhere around there, you know, 30 million yeah. eyeballs for 30 million bucks. Do you think this playbook is runnable at a million bucks? I think there's more risk involved, right? Because it's unknown how big it's actually going to get. I think if you had the they chance, they say to... no risk, no Rari. <laughs> you got to risk it mm. for the biscuit, <laughs> yeah, as they say. That's right. <laughs> so oh three, oh four, oh five, whatever. Let's say oh seven. He's made his first pivot. He's actually building online content in what is still kind of a youngish internet world. Yeah. Uh, if you had the chance to invest, then of course, knowing what we know now, we do that. I think then it looks a little more risky, but you look for some signals, right? A couple of things that I thought about. Is there a community? Has he built a community, right? Mm -hmm. And is that community loyal? If so, you can probably monetize it in some way, shape, or form. And he certainly had that from day one, but I don't know what the growth looks like because none of that data is shared. I've got to imagine it was pretty decent. Yeah. And I'm sure Chernin was aware of it. I think his adaptability was a pretty big thing. Making that pivot in the first place really matters. You've got to be able to follow the market where it goes. And I mean, look at Disney, right? They used to be maniacally focused on hand-drawn animation, classic animation. Pixar was the world of CG, computers. No, that's not our wheelhouse. And it took a kind of a meeting of the minds and Steve Jobs to pull them together. But that is how Disney operates now. Everything is CG, right? And so they had the ability to pivot eventually through a great push from Steve Jobs. It's no different. I think if you can find that in even the million-dollar business, do they have the ability to adapt can they sense the changes? Can they pivot? Do you have evidence of that? Do you believe the community's there? 
Have they monetized it already? Those are all probably pretty good signals, but I think it can be found. It's just a riskier bet. As a software guy, would you rather do it in a media? If you had $1 million, one bet to put $1 million. One seed investment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would you rather do it in a product dev software company that hasn't gone to market yet, but the product is built, or a YouTube channel that has the community, but no product built behind it yet. Ha has like the eyeballs and attention, but no product or a software business that has a stellar product, but no eyeballs and attention. <sighs> you Don't give me a consulting answer. I'm, gonna do, to I'm going, I'm going for the YouTube. I think one, you have like unlimited shots at bat. I think you may get hit a couple times, but like, I think you look at Graham Stephan. Shots on goal or swings at bat. A little bit of both. I like that. It's <laughs> twice as powerful. Analogy. Twice as powerful. <laughs> Don't mix them. Best of both worlds. <laughs> both worlds. But yeah, if I invest into that, I have like multiple shots on gold, shoots at hoop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know Graham Stephan actually had this with Hermosi, like Alex Hermosi. They were talking on like the little shows. He has no idea how to monetize eyeballs at all. And so if you have like that skill Graham set. Graham Stephan doesn't. Graham Stephan. Right. I imagine the same thing was with that one guy, I guess. Yeah, because he actually brought in. So the guy, what was the dude's name with the cars and bids? He brought in this yeah. guy named Blake Machado, who was like a big private equity dude before. And that's how they launched cars and bids so from the YouTube channel to that. And so he actually gave him equity, he did a little buy-in, I think, and then raised money off of that to go and do that. And that's how they launched cars and bids and sold it to Trend Group. Shout out to Media Choir, but... Do a little plug there, but um, wait, what's media? But no, just yeah, kidding. just go check it out. But <laughs> in the show notes, <laughs> check it out. Yeah, check the link to buy out. Uh, just seeing where everything is going. Like, if you have distribution attention and you can own that and control it, I see what Turnin's doing with that. I think that's like they're what they understand. And uh, if only there was like a go through the marketplace that you can go to, man, to buy that'd be amazing eyeballs like that. Okay, Bobby, so you should start that's, that <laughs> mediaquire.com. I'll send them the bill for yeah. sponsoring. Sponsor today's show. Bobby, did Chandler persuade you? He did. Yes. Really? Yeah. You're moving your... Well, look, if I can run a fund of one, which is I've got one investment to make. Don't think of it as a fund of one. Think of it just as a syndication of one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Point being is you've got an unknown, right? And yeah, you may have built up a great product, but if you don't know if there's actual demand for that product, if you don't have product market fit, the elusive product market fit we talk about, yeah, uh, it's a pretty dangerous investment if you're making one bet, so which is take, why- You'll take audience over product. I will take the audience over product with one assumption that that audience is a captive audience. Captive meaning what? That they're not one-time unique views. It's not churn and burn, but you have the no, same users. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a million. Subscribers. It's, it's okay. A, yeah, you're coming a, back. It's a YouTube subscribed channel. I mean, I subscribe to channels that I never watch. So, well, yeah, that's as close as you can get. It works, but I behind think... the scenes, you can actually see the views data. Oh, and so, for yeah. sure. And so my point is subscribers that are regularly coming back to consume content. And I think that, yeah, that's a bet you make because you can, f mm. you can take a few bites into the apple, right? Yeah. I think that due diligence is pretty heavy on the creator too, that they're willing to go the long run that like, Hey, this isn't your last play. You're looking for that next big thing as well. Like the second exit. Like, I think that's what they do with like Portner, right? I think he was told him like, yeah, I know this can get taken a lot higher, a lot further. And so we have to go, I'll give up the equity for now. Take a little bit of chips off the table and then start moving forward. He knew it was a growth play. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the move. If you shout out deal. Yeah. Maven. Shout out what? Deal Maven invest into creator businesses. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a buddy that I just talked to today who raised a fund from creators. Like all of the LPs in the fund are creators. I think it's mostly Instagram heavy. And they're taking some portion of the fund to basically build a fulfillment center like resin, like basically manufacturing to be able to spin up any resin product that they want to. He gets 20% carry. There's no management fee on it. And the idea is they kind of collaborate on what is the best makeup product that they can dev out. They are focusing on D to C products that they can try to push between everybody's audience. So they dev it out, they run the minimum order quantities in order to get it out. And then all of the limited partners push it to their mm -hmm. audiences that they've, you know, the people that are going to run it and then the hope is, the bet is, they're trying to find 
prime for Logan Paul. Right. Hasn't been, obviously, physical product has like inherent exitability if you can get distribution, particularly in brick and mortar, Target, all those places, you know, higher upfront costs. And so that, that's the playbook that he's running is he's betting that with the LPs that are centered around audience, that they're going to be able to have multiple shots at bat to dev out great products that then they can build a brand around the hero product that they launch and try to turn those brands into something that's exitable. Shots on goal at bats? <laughs> Shots at bat. <laughs> Throws at bat. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, It'll it's start an, catching on. Just but gives It's an out. R&D play, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. The operator of it is an ex... Uh, no, he's a current Bane guy. I won't give any more details because, you know, who knows what... I mean, with our audience, who knows who could be listening? What if I know him? <laughs> Shout out Joe Biden. He's worked in similar states as you. All right. And I think that it's hard to underprice the power of a tight community more than audience because audience is a little ephemeral. Like you can have. Yeah. Community matters. Yeah. There's a difference. And like, I think when you have that community, it's really hard to miss multiple shots at bat. Well, the audience doesn't always engage, but the community does, right? Totally. Yeah. So we changed you from a tech guy to a media YouTube guy. guy. Uh, yeah, a deal maven, one might say. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to maven. <clears throat> okay. Well, that's what we got. Congrats to one. Dave Portnoy for crushing it. And you killed it. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.